The G20 summit in New Delhi is over, as is India's presidency of the forum. As the dust settles, what came out of the event and what are its implications? It was a Grand Slam triumph for a veteran and a newbie at the US Open this year. Novak Djokovic won his 24th Grand Slam and 19-year-old Coco Gauff won her first. What do these victories mean for the world of tennis? This is The Daily Debrief. These are our stories for the day. And before you go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. The G20 summit concluded in New Delhi on September 10th amid quite a bit of fanfare. Now, while the G20 is supposed to be an economic platform, the question on everyone's mind was whether there would be a joint statement due to differences on the Ukraine war. Finally, a statement was released, which would have given much satisfaction to India since G20 has been a major campaign plank domestically for the Narendra Modi government. Now, the Western media is portraying the declaration as a concession or a gracious compromise made by the West to keep G20 alive. This is because it does not have any reference to the word aggression in relation to Russia. But is this enough to salvage G20? We have with us Prabir Purkhasa who has been watching the development of all these blocks. Prabir, thanks so much for joining us. You have been tracking the G20 summit very closely. Now, a lot of people had expected that there would be no statement because all the signs indicated that, but a statement did come out. Uh, there was no reference to Russian aggression, of course, which seemed to have been the single biggest point of debate. Now, uh, what does, uh, you know, what do you, what do you read out of this? The fact that there was actually a statement. All, all sections are claiming victory in various ways. So, how do you sort of analyze this? Well, let's, go with that, that everybody has won. You know, that's a very nice feeling that we can carry. That this time, unlike Bali, where the Ukraine become an acrimonious, divisive point in which Russia and China did not agree to that paragraph, this time everybody has come to a unified paragraph. Now, you know, if you are an uh, international arena expert, then you will read from this the tea leaves. And there can be various arguments in favor of what has changed the last one year. Because it's a fact that the European Union and the United States, we're not counting the United Kingdom as a major independent player in this, did back off from saying no over our dead bodies, which is what they seem to have done in Bali, which finally led to you know, the statement having that paragraph in which the, you know, it was not a unified statement, shall we say. This time they seem to have backed off. So there could be two interpretations of the tea leaves. One is that they're reading the scenario that the global South countries are not interested in choosing sides on this issue. They would like to build their trade relationships with both. They're not going to sanction Russia. That is clear over the last uh, two years. And they're not going to get into a military take this side or that side issue on Ukraine. So this is one issue on which countries like India, countries like South Africa, countries like Brazil would all be united on this particular position and therefore keeping it out. Now, the United States has claimed victory, of course, interpreting various clauses. In it. We won't get into that. The fact that they did oppose dropping of that particular paragraph, which was there in Bali, that this took a lot of uh, negotiations before it was decided. As I said, could be, could be due to the fact that the world opinion is increasingly unwilling to become a party to the conflict. It is between Russia in, and NATO countries and its allies, and others would like to continue the trade economic relationships with Russia. It's a big player in terms of oil and uh, natural gas. It's also a big, big player in terms of coal, in terms of food, in terms of fertilizers. So a lot of countries have a stake in their continued economic relationships with Russia. So that's one way of looking at it. Other way of looking at it, and if you've been following uh, Bhadr Ambassador Bhadra Kumar's pieces, that the, since the, uh, essentially the Ukrainian offensive has run out of steam, and this is what the American media also seeming to, seeming to suggest with, you know, 
shall we say whistling in the dark statements we should we should fight continue till the fight should continue till 19 uh, 2025 and then ukraine may win etc etc et but the idea that Russia is going to be defeated shortly, Crimea will be taken back. All of this doesn't seem to be a possibility. So Ambassador Bhandrakumar has argued there are some signs now that possible discussions of either leading to a frozen conflict or a larger peace accord may be a possibility and maybe discussions may start. Therefore, again, I'm saying maybe, Again, reading tea leaves is not my profession. <laughs> so, so I would say the possibility that this come, come down in some sense of the Western powers in uh, the G20 may be an indication of not taking such a hard position because they would like to now start at least getting other intermediaries in the process of getting to talk to Russia. Because as it stands, uh, that they have really almost foreclosed as of now, and they need somebody to start the discussion. Zelensky's response to this does show that he at least is very unhappy that the West has not backed him as he thought they would and as they did in Bali. So yes, and we also have to give uh, giving uh, the Indian team the credit that they did manage to hold on and try to get everybody or everybody to agree on a statement. And they seem to have had that leverage to be able to do this. So yes, I think credit to the Indian team for having also come out and negotiated what has been a unified G20 statement, unlike the Bali statement, which had differences writ large on in terms of Ukraine. Right. Prabir, one of our focus points on this show and in many other shows, People's Dispatch does is also the larger, shall we say, future of some of these blocks. Now, we talked about the in the past, we talked about how, for instance, the economic factors in itself indicate that the G20 is a bit shaky as opposed to some of the other blocks we're seeing in the world. Do you think this summit really has changed anything as far as that is concerned, or is that a much more long-term process which is unaffected by individual summits and uh, joint statements and stuff like that? Well, the joint statements and summits of this kind of blocks would also indicate the shift of the economic and political power. Now, the fact that the African Union has come in, the European Union came in long back, the African Union has come in just now, would seem to indicate again the growing economic leverage of the global south. This, if you remember, 50 years back, the European powers and of course the United States really ruled the economic world. They decided the rules and ultimately with the fall of Soviet Union and the founding of WTO, it seemed that the US writ and its allies, the writ would large uh, run large on particularly the geostrategic but also the economic sphere. After all, the IMF and the World Bank uh, have enshrined the power of both the United States and the Euro and Europe, the ex-colonial powers in that power structure that exists. So if an economic change takes place, then the IMF and the World Bank changing those structures may be, may be quite difficult. So either we have alternate structures come up, and then the question is in this alternate structures which may come up, which BRICS of course is one of them, but there could be many others, ASEAN, West Asia, they're all trying to work out their economic future as well as Africa. So where do they all meet? So G20's original writ, if you remember, from what, what was originally G8 and then G7, was economic issues and it came in the context of 2008 global financial crisis, which is really the crisis of the American and the European banks. So given that, the fact that we have a G20 as a talk shop, but still a talk shop in which discussions can take place, the issue of whether a realignment of economic forces will take place is a place where G20 could please, still please play such role. But of course, let's fit, play, place it this way. The stake that Mr. Modi had had in a successful G20, I don't think other countries will have or even Brazil would have. So therefore, this is something which 
Mr. Modi needed much more than any other leader of a country may need, partly because of the fact that he still wants to show that he has a, a enormous, what shall we say, uh, leverage in the global world, the Vishwa Guru image, which India now wants to project somehow that we will lead the world. Uh, we don't have to take it internationally so seriously, but domestically it has at least increased his stature that he led a successful G20 initiative. India played a role, a big role, and the fact that India spent a lot of money, but that is, you know, given a country of India's size, people may disregard that. Yes, it did cause problems of different kinds, but I don't think that should be, in that sense, be counterposed to what is an international event and what is the outcome of that. So I don't think I would give up the idea that G20 doesn't have any role. It is. It was supposed to be dealing with the economic issues, and the economic issues are important today. Restructuring of the economic world outside the WTO, outside the IMF, and outside the World Bank, how will it proceed? We don't know. As you know, IMF, World Bank restructuring is almost impossible. Okay, They have had no attempt to do that over the last 20, 25 years. Enough discussion has taken place. No movement at all on that, and I doubt very much it's feasible. On the question of WTO, the United States, given the fact it is in a sanctions war against different countries, WTO's days, it seems, are numbered, or at least it will go into cold storage for the time being. So G20 is about the only place where two sides can meet and have a discussion. And with African Union coming in, I think that's a welcome uh, development and let's see where it goes. Right, Prabhupada. And finally, very briefly, uh, one of the announcements was also for corridor that they're talking about <clears throat> connecting India, West Asia, and then Europe. Do you see that actually, you know, sort of uh, tra transforming anything? Of course, I think even the protagonists have said that it's going to take a lot of time, but still interesting that even the proposal has come up. Well, I have not understood the proposal because though there is a line on a map showing a connection between Europe, what it appears to the Mediterranean Ocean, the Mediterranean Sea, connecting actually to Israel and then going through West Asia, like Saudi Arabia and so on, and then to India. Now, actually, if you look at the map, there is already a Suez Canal, okay? So ships do, and as we know, uh, from the amount of traffic that goes to the Suez Canal, the ships, container ships do go through that in large numbers, the huge traffic on that. So I don't see a corridor of the kind, for instance, which Russia is trying to develop to Central Asia and Iran, then to the Indian Ocean, how that is relevant to a West Asia, Europe and South Asia, Southeast Asia uh, scenario. So if there wasn't any such Suez Canal, yes, but there is. And large tankers, of course, go around Africa. So the only question would be if West Asia wants to link through pipelines to Saudi, from Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates to Israel, and then use that as a conduit to uh, Europe. Now that would mean Saudi Arabia and Israel's relationships have to change. And at the moment, Saudi Arabia has not shown any inclination to join what is called the Abraham Accords, unlike, for instance, the United Arab Emirates. So given that, I don't really understand the dimension that they're talking about this corridor, except, except to say, well, there seem to be the European side has uh, good wishes or uh, optimistic about trying to get oil out of West Asia into uh, Europe. Right. But in, I think in the West Asia scenario, and West Asia is emerging as an independent set of players. You have Qatar, you have Kuwait, you have uh, United Arab Emirates, all players, and particularly UAE and uh, Qatar are very much players. And let's not forget, Turkey is very much there. So I think that dynamics is not a European South Asian dynamics. It's a very different dynamics, which is playing out today in West Asia. And if you look at West Asia, they would like to control their future 
by themselves. I don't think they would give the leadership of West Asia either to the United States or to European Union or to South Asia for that matters. So I think this is very much uh, kite flying by European Union and the United States to get something out of uh, right. this summit and talk about some alternative to Belt Road Initiative, use that as a peg to damn the Chinese a little more and all of that. They are most welcome to do that. And India has no love lost for the Belt Road Initiative either. But the point is that, does it make sense to link what is already linked? So Belt Road Initiative comes to link Central Asia to China, to Russia, and to Europe. And if Western Europe doesn't want that, so be it. But what does India gain in addition to the linkage it already has to West Asia? It's quite closely linked to West Asia. And it is also linked via Suez Canal to Europe. So right. I have not understood this corridor, honestly. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Prabir. Of course, uh, I guess the implications will play out for quite some time and we'll be watching it. Thank you so much for talking to us. A 24th time Grand Slam victor and a first time Grand Slam winner. The men and women's US Open tournaments were a picture in contrast. On the one hand, we have Coco Goff, all of 19 years old, who became the youngest winner of a US Open since Serena Williams. On the other hand, there is Novak Djokovic at Grand Slam number 24 and promising that he'll be around for quite a while longer. We have with us Siddhan Tane for an analysis. Siddhan, thanks so much for joining us. So let's start with the women's tournament first. A dream run for Coco Goff at 19 years old, winning her first Grand Slam tournament. And in some senses, I think, uh, let's take the uh, women's uh, uh, tournament as a whole, as not just the US Open, but also, you know, previous Opens as well. It indicates a fresh generation of players. It looks like a lot of challengers emerging, quite a tough contest. So how do you sort of analyze this victory? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're spot on with your analysis, Prashant. Uh, because we've talked about this quite often in the context of, of various Grand Slams, whenever it comes up on debrief. Uh, that actually uh, the, the 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 openness uh, that there there is in the WTA, the, which is the women's professional tour, uh, after the departure of let's say or the dominance of Serena Williams and the like, uh, has been great to see over the past few years. Uh, Arena Sabalenka, who is uh, Coco Gauff, played in the final herself, has had an incredible run. Uh, we've seen Ons Jabor, we've seen so many uh, young players emerging and playing, you know, uh, finals of major major events. It's actually uh, also a testament to how the WTA itself is organized and how, uh, despite tennis being this sport, or maybe because tennis is a sport still uh, reserved for the super elite, uh, that so much care is taken of athletes who exist within the system. And in many ways, they are <clears throat> the prime stakeholders uh, in the overall structure of the sport. So their interests are taken care of, uh, irrespective of where they uh, come, might come from or... You know, um, of course, ranking and all of those things matter in this as well. Uh, and younger or sort of lower ranked players do tend to struggle. Uh, but overall, the kind of system that they're trying to create is one that encourages the growth of the sport and structures in, it in such a way that, that um, athletes are emer able to emerge. And, and with young players emerging now on both sides of uh, tennis, men and women. Uh, the men's draw also, if you take uh, Novak Djokovic out of it, Everyone else is uh, still very much in their early to mid-twenties. So, so a great deal of young talent on the men's side as well, uh, Prashant. But, but uh, overall, it's been uh, progressively more interesting to watch the women's side because you never know who's uh, going to emerge. You're likely to see new champions and new storylines emerging. And also the fact that so many things happened over the course of the tournament with Coco Goff on the sidelines. Uh, there was a protest by some uh, environmental activists at one of her games where the game was actually stopped for a long time and the match was in the balance, you know. So, uh, there are several players who've in the past gone out and said that, you know, this is not the stage uh, for people to protest and, and raise uh, other issues out that don't necessarily belong on a tennis court uh, because it disrupts us and the work that we are trying to put in uh, and all of that. But, but Goff in the post-match uh, press conference said that, you know, if this is a platform where others can also find uh, a way to express their voices and their opinions on important issues that make an impact to all of us, then, you know, more power to them, essentially. So, so these kind of uh, things also indicate, Prashant, how uh, athletes are no longer always in this super bubble uh, where, you know, only their sport and those things matter. 
they are more and more uh, in tune with what's happening in the world outside and are less afraid i think especially those who achieve uh, some uh, level of uh, understanding of how the system is and how fleeting anyway uh, the fame and and the popularity and all of those things are uh, unless you back it up with you know something of greater substance so many of them coming out and doing that and i, and I think women athletes across the board have taken uh, that leadership uh, role uh, in in the sports scene in general of course sidan going to the men's draw we're not going to be talking about the goat debate or anything of that sort but 24 grand slams is a remarkable achievement for uh, djokovic in this point and he seems to indicate very clearly that he is going to be around for many many more years i think at some point he said he's going to be around for 20 years and then we'll see or something but no sign of him slowing down absolutely not in fact uh, just i i think on some physical metrics and and because uh, together with his longevity or the longevity of his career uh, other athletes in the sport prashant have also up their levels consistently so the technology that djokovic and his team employ maybe he's on another level uh, but other athletes also have access to similar technologies in terms of strength and conditioning uh, in terms of recovery and how you manage uh, your you know your your the wear and tear on your body uh, along with uh, getting the kind of uh, peak training level so that you can perform when it comes to these big events so so uh, the science of it uh, is being worked on greatly and millions and in fact billions of dollars goes into uh, all of that so so there's a, there's a huge amount of kind of structure that supports these athletes uh, and uh, on some of these metrics novak djokovic looks like he's at the age of 36 at his prime <clears throat> or we don't even know whether his prime might be <laughs> still to come so you know and we've often disagreed on aspects of his politics and and all of that and this has nothing to do it's not an endorsement necessarily of how uh, novak djokovic has used the tennis system to his own advantage when it suits his convenience uh, but but just to kind of demonstrate uh, <clears throat> what a super athlete he is uh, and hopefully uh, you know it it remains the doping science remains a step ahead of whatever other science is going on so that we can be sh- uh, assured that all of these athletes are of course uh, clean and 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 just putting uh, the right kind of work in in the right places to do the kind of stuff they're doing but yeah if he continues at this pace uh, 35 40 grand slams might be a realistic possibility thanks so much sudan for talking to us uh, quite intriguing in some senses and we're going to have a fresh set of grand slams next year as well to sort of see how and we can see how many of these players where do they reach exactly thank you so much And that's all we have time for today in this episode of Daily Debrief. Do visit our website peoplesdispatch.org. Do go to YouTube, hit that subscribe button and make sure to watch more episodes of this show. Until tomorrow.